Here is the Crescendo Music Education Podcast, episode number 38. This podcast is being recorded on the lands of the Turrbal people. I acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. They were the first music makers on this land. Finally, 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 I get to chat to Paul Jarman. We've been trying to make this happen for quite some time now with bad internet connections and, and I don't know, life getting in our way. But I finally had to have my chat with Paul Jarman. Those of you who do not know the amazing work of Paul Jarman, Jarms, then you really need to find find it, have a look at it, listen to it. It's just amazing. I knew that this was going to be a really interesting chat because I just think Paul has an amazing, not only a great talent, but a really lovely heart and advanced musicianship skills and storytelling skills. It's just an inspiration to be around. So I I just knew this would be a good podcast. As it turns out, it's actually going to be three podcasts. His journey is so interesting. And welcome to the Crescendo Music Education Podcast, Mr. Paul Jarman. Hello. G'day. Thanks so much, Debbie, for having me along. It's great to see you. We have been trying to record this for some time now. I'm glad we finally pinned it down with good internet. Yes, I am at a friend's house in town. So just to let you all know, we live in a property not far from here. It's only five kilometres up the road, but we live in a very mountainous area. And so as soon as you're behind a couple of valleys, you your internet's much slower. So um, the upload and download combination is just that bit under to, to record a good Zoom. So we, it's good having friends in town. <laughs> that is fabulous and it's good it's good for me that you have friends in town actually jams you have friends all over the world you know that <laughs> but it is good for me that one of them lives close and has internet yeah well thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it it's um great it's a great idea what you're doing and and getting all these amazing people together and it actually just goes to show how many friends you've got and how much they respect you deb oh oh Thank you. Okay, that's the end of the podcast. That's all I wanted out of you. Bye. No, 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 not at all. Okay, I'm actually going to start with a little bit of your bio. Now, I'm not reading all of it. It's extensive and it's impressive. So I will get it up the slide. I guess not your full, full bio because that's probably a novel, but a more extensive bio I will put in the show notes. So if people want to read more, they can. But in case you've never heard of Paul Jarman, well, do yourself a favour and find out about him. But anyway, he is a widely acclaimed Australian composer, performer, music director, conductor and educator. His music has inspired singers and audiences around the world. As a cultural ambassador, he has performed extensively throughout Australia, Europe, Asia, North America and the Pacific in over 40 countries with theatre productions, dance ensembles, Aboriginal Anglo-Celtic performance groups, choirs and orchestras, in festivals, special events, schools, towns. Um, Can I just say at this point, I'll just go dot, dot, dot. There is so much and most people in music education, certainly in music education in Australia, know of Paul Jarman and his wonderful work and his giving inspiring nature. So I'm let I'll let people read the details as I've said. But is there anything you want to tell people specifically about your bio before we go on? Oh well I I wrote it, so don't believe a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um <laughs> Bios are interesting things, aren't they? I mean, yeah. yeah. But um, look, it's uh, I'm just one of those grateful musicians, really. I've I've had a, you know, I've really have had a fantastic experience in my career, and where I am today, and I probably would share this with a lot of younger musicians, is, you know, it's important to know this that often you'll end up in a place you didn't even know you were heading, 
you know, um, and where I am today and the world that I'm in with music. If you told me that 30 years ago when I started out that this is what I'd be doing, I, I just wouldn't have even understood it, let alone dreamed that that's what I would be doing, you know. So I think music and the arts in general, but music particularly, it's it's so diverse, you know, and I'm just a grateful musician who's managed to be part of so many different aspects of the of the music industry, you know, and I literally just started out just as a, a, a player, you know, just no, playing no, in don't, bands. Yeah, don't say just, okay, <laughs> don't say just. Didn't so you were way. playing in a band and were your visions, say 30 years ago, your visions were you were going to be a performer. That was what. Yeah. And, and yeah. what happened and how did your trajectory change? Or should I say not change, split? <laughs> yeah, look, I was very lucky. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I came from maybe a, not sheltered's the wrong word, because I, I, you know, I had a fantastic youth. My parents were great. We, we actually traveled around the world um, very much on a budget, but, you know, I had really adventurous parents that introduced us to a lot of music and my whole family are, are musicians or connected to it, um, all my siblings. So we had a great experience, but, you know, I'm a child of the seventies and growing up where I did in the blue mountains, west of Sydney, the world seemed so much further away, you know, than it does for kids these days. So the word sheltered's wrong to say it in that context, but I hope it describes everyone sort of how I saw the world. Cause I had no idea that I could even jump on a plane and go away and travel and tour. It just wasn't in my periphery, you know, from, from sort of my sort of Western Sydney, you know, background. I, I guess anyone who's lived in the burbs back in the seventies and eighties would probably understand what I'm talking about. Mm. You know, this is no internet. There's, you know, those dreams just weren't there. So, you know, for me, I was a bit of a, bit of a dreaming hippie muso, you know, I just wanted to play in bands and that's where I just saw my whole life. And um, I, I used to do a lot of bushwalking and rock climbing and I was into sort of that, that natural world too. So a lot of my playing, you know, and a lot of people don't know this about me, but I, I'd learned a lot of my instruments underneath waterfalls and out on the side of mountains. And okay. I just take instruments out to the bush and, you know, I'd sit there sometimes for days or even a week or so and just play music and read books. And that's sort of how I started out. But, um, you know, I was just playing in rock bands, if you want to call them that I had a couple of bands that were, you know, we were thinking we were going to do the thing and we supported some famous bands and we went on tour and we, we made no money, <laughs> but, but gee, did we have fun. And, and they were, you know, they were awesome, you know, experiences. And I'm talking about playing back in the Sydney pub scene back in the eighties, you know, at the, the lands down and the hope town and Vic on the park. And, and we'd, we'd go and play in clubs and pubs where there were seven bands on in one night and we'd be on at 3 a.m. in the morning and, you know, we'd be getting falafels on the side of the road as the sun came up and that's sort of, that's sort of how you lived your life, you know, and, um, you know, these are pub, pubs full of smoke and, you know, it's just a different world, you know, but it was just fantastic, you know, and um, I loved it. And to fund that, I actually just took on um, private students, you know, this is in my early 20s. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that, um, that got me through and things were building, but they weren't really going anywhere. And, um, I was at the time too, I actually did some work on the side. I worked in a law firm for, for two <laughs> years, um, full time, like working in a law firm uh, and, doing, um, doing what in the law firm? Oh, uh, pretty much just a general, general rouse about, <laughs> I, I didn't have a law degree, but when I was um, when I was at, at school, I did two part time jobs. This was after school. I actually worked in a law firm two nights a week, just doing their books and catalogs and, you know, that sort of filing sort of job. So I would jump on the train after school and catch it down to the city. And I'd work in this law firm till like, you know, 11 at night and then catch the train all the way back home to the Blue Mountains and get into bed about, you know, 1230. So that was one of my jobs. And the other job I had actually was in the Australian Army because I was I was in the Australian Army Reserves because um, I spent all my time out in the bush, you know, and I thought, well, I pretty much just get paid doing what I like doing. So um, that's how I got myself through um, year 11 and 12. Oh, you know, so, wow. so when when I when I was a young muso in my 20s and I would had quite a I won't probably won't go into it too much now, but 
I had a very serious incident in my life. Um, when I was 19, I got hit by a truck. Um, I was a motorbike rider. And um, yeah, this guy just went through a stop sign and, and um, wiped me out. And it took no. me, um, yeah, that was when I was, I was 19. And um, it took me um, pretty much, well, made about a year, but two full years, I'd say, to get over it and recover from all my injuries. And um, a lot of soul searching, a lot of thinking, but you know, as a young guy, I, you know, I, I can't really remember the process of getting over it really, I, um, except getting in touch with my body and knowing how the body heals from things. But anyway, to cut a long story short, after that accident, I needed a job, you know, um, I didn't have any really real prospects. I was 21 years old when I, when I sort of started to recover. So I rang up the law firm that I used to work at after school and um, they were fantastic. They just gave me a job straight away. And so for two years, I was working in a law firm um, and playing gigs at night. You know, I'm talking six or seven gigs a week <laughs> and working all day in this law firm doing just doing sort of paralegal work, you know, helping the, the, the lawyers when they go to court. You know, I was the person pushing the trolley around with all the files and doing errands all over town, all over Sydney. And um, I really loved it. But then I just I think I got a little bit. Um, I don't know, I was just heading a different way in my life. And I knew I wanted to be a musician. That's all I wanted. And plus, my hair was getting a bit long, and they didn't like that. <laughs> so, so I left the um, I left the law firm. And um, I actually got a job at a secondhand record store. And it was just the best experience. Um, it's, it's not in existence anymore. But at the time, and some of the listeners might know, it's called it was called Ashwood's. And Ashwood's, if you talk to any uh, record, you know, vinyl uh, nut, they'll say that Ashwood's was the best secondhand record store in Australia. So it was a crazy wild place. Um, and <laughs> I just loved it. And I, I worked there for two years. And, um, you know, just, I don't know, once again, just trying to find what I was going to do with my life. And, um, you know, a friend of mine is a record producer. And, um, he came up to me one day, I think I might have done a session for him. And um, he just said to me after the session, he said, Are you a musician? And I said, Yeah. And he said, he said, No, you're not. He said, you, you work in a secondhand record store. Are you really a musician? <laughs> and um, I said, Yeah. And he said, You're not. You're not until you actually do it. He said, Are you going to do this man or not? You know, and I thought about that. And I was like, Yeah, that's it. So the next day, I handed in my resignation. <gasps> to Ashwoods and um, at 25 years old, uh, yeah, must, must have been 24, 25. I just became a full-time musician um, and I had no idea how I was going to um, fund it all, except I just knew that I wanted to do it, you know, and it was the best thing I ever did was listen to, to John's advice and just get myself out there, try my hardest and, um, and it paid off, you know, um, you know, it took a few years, but yeah. Paid off. At, at this point, what instruments did you play? Um, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I was playing keyboards. And at that time, uh, I was playing a Fender Rhodes keyboard with like a Moog sort of thing on top. And they've all come back in fashion now. You know, all the kids are listening to the same, exactly the same stuff. So I was lugging this sort of 80 kilo Fender, <laughs> Fender Rhodes around. Um, and I was also playing saxophone, um, clarinet, all the woodwind instruments and a um, bit of bass guitar. But then my big lucky break came and it's something we should talk about because yes. if it wasn't for this lucky break, I wouldn't be talking to you now. You know, so many things in my life I wouldn't have. And I'd love to touch on some lucky break stories later because, mate, I can tell you, that yeah, if it wasn't for some people in my life, I don't even know how I'd, I'd be here. And I'd love to be able to tell you how important those people are to me. One of them is my first piano teacher, by the way, who I'd love to talk about later. Could you oh. remind me? Oh, that's okay. Re okay, hold on, hold on. Let me just, Put a little let me just write <laughs> that down. Okay, piano teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just it's just nice to be able to share with people how grateful I am for some of these things that happened to me in my life. But yeah, so I, I was passionate about going overseas. All I wanted to do uh, was go to India, actually. I just thought India, India, India. I want to go to India and I want to learn how to play tabla and, and, and I want to learn how to play um, 
maybe the the um, the Mohan Vina or the the not the sitar, but I was into some of the stringed instruments, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to go and learn how to play some of them? And um, anyway, I had the Lonely Planet book. So you've got to remember again, folks, this is pre-internet. So I had the Lonely Planet book sitting right there next to my phone. So every the home phone. So every time <laughs> I went to the home phone, I had to read it, read on this Lonely Planet book of India. And I've still got that book, by the way. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, I'm saving up to go to India. And um, that was it. It's all I wanted to do. I get home and on the answer phone is this message that says, Bill O'Toole, manager of Sirocco, call me regarding a tour to India. Here's oh, wow, now, rang, yes. Yeah, I, I rang my dad and I said, Dad, I got this call from this guy from Sirocco. Have you heard of the band Sirocco? And dad, of course, just he flipped out. He's like, ring, ring, <laughs> whatever you do, ring. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, ring that number. And, um, and so for those who don't know, Sirocco, um, pretty much, you could say they are the pioneers or one of the main pioneers of, you know, it's a funny term, but world music, you know, in mm -hmm. Australia. And at the time, Sirocco had been going for about close to 20 years, and they toured all over the world and um, a flagship group, you know, touring for the Australian government and all sorts of things, which I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. So for a young, you know, 25 year old hippie with, you know, stars in his eyes and <laughs> wanting to go to India, this was like, I, I just can't tell you what it meant to me. I went from, you know, making $12 a gig <laughs> to quite the opposite, just pretty much overnight. So anyway, I rang Bill and uh, I went down, had a fantastic meeting with him in his office. And a month later, I'm traveling around India with one of Australia's leading bands, you know, it was actually their fourth tour of India, that one, they'd already been there three times, or maybe four times. And it just blew my mind. I just, you know, if you ask the guys now, they said I was like, like a kid at a candy shop the whole time. But um, it just blew my mind. And I realized how much I needed to be back there and in, in Asia, actually, in general, you know, because it just was my world, I felt so happy. And, you know, I've been there many times since, of course. But I just, yeah, it changed, it changed my life. And the band was so professional, so much fun, musically so great. And I learned so much, you know. And suddenly I went from playing keyboards and saxophones to playing about 20 different instruments from all over the world. But literally, <laughs> you know, Bill, he's just fantastic. He'd just say, Jams, take this. And he'd give me some... Thing, if an Irish whistle or a French bombard or a cabret or whatever, and you say, I want you to learn it. And we're, we're, in the, we're in the back of a bloody bus driving around the back of the desert of India. And here's me up the back learning how to play these instruments. But I, I think Bill could see straight away that I had, you know, and I'm not saying this egotistically, but I just had the right attitude. Mm -hmm. And the attitude to have is, yes, I'll do it. I'm grateful for it. I'm going to give it my best. And here's one that'll blow your mind because years later, I asked Bill, I said, why on earth did you ring me? You know, because these were guys 20 years older than me who had global experience, who all played multiple instruments. They were leaders in the world music scene. I had no idea. I mean, really, I, I was so green to the whole thing. And I, I mean, they could have hired anyone. They could have got the top players, you know, in the country. And I found out that Bill had come to see me play in one of my bands at the Manly Jazz Festival a couple of days before. And what had happened is that one of the members of Sirocco um, that they'd had, he was starting to whinge a lot on tour. You know, I don't want to carry the bags. I'm sick of carrying the cases. And, you know, this hotel isn't good enough or whatever, whatever it was. He was just whinging, you know. <laughs> and, and Bill just was sick of it, you know, and he thought we, ha we have to get rid of this guy, you know. <laughs> And so when I, <laughs> when I joined the band, I was the opposite. I'm like, do you want me to help you with the gear? I'll carry the cases, you know? <laughs> and I mean, look, 30 years later, I'm still the same guy, you know? Yeah, yeah so I can actually I, still see you being just like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like the cases are there. I'll, I'll give you a hand, yep. you know? They're not even mine, but I'll carry them. And I often tell this to young students. I say, you know, the, the life I've had now 
because if it wasn't for that band, I, I wouldn't have even met my wife. My children wouldn't be alive, you know, because I met my wife, Bonnie, through music and playing at a festival with Sirocco. So if it wasn't for that band, my whole life would be different, you know, and I put it down to the willingness to carry cases. <laughs> it's, like, it's not about the music. It's like, yeah, I'll, I've got this life because I, I was happy to carry the gear. <laughs> yeah, that's That's probably why you stayed. However seeing you performing had to be part of it they couldn't see you on stage and go hey there looks like a good dude that'll carry our cases and not whinge right there had hate, to be i hate to tell you the truth <laughs> i hate to th but this is why bill's a genius like because you can teach a young person who's keen you can teach them anything you can teach anyone anything if they are willing to do it and they're mm -hmm. happy and grateful right so for me, I asked Bill, and I was at the time probably a little bit mortified when I found out it had nothing to do with my musical skills. But I said, you know, why did you hire me? And he said, you know what? He said, I wasn't interested in the, in the show at all. And he said, I waited around after the show because I wanted to see what you were like off the stage. And he said, you went over. I watched you thank the sound guy. You went up and shook the hands of the people doing the, the lights or whatever. You went and talked to people in the audience. You noticed a kid in the crowd and you went up and showed him your instrument, whatever. He said, none of the other guys in the band did that, you know, and he said, well, that that was when I knew that you were the, the guy for the job. And, you know, it, it probably took me a few years to realize how accurate that is, you know, because you can be the best muso in the world. You can play everything right. But unless you can get along with the group and realize how lucky you are to be playing and just have that that positive outlook touring relies on all that you know you ask any touring musician if you've spent 30 years in hotel rooms and planes and buses and cars if you've got to have the right temperament you know to be able to pull it off and you know all i can say is that i was really grateful for for that opportunity to play with sirocco because i mean you're interviewing me in a choral education aspect here we even even started that part of my journey but if it wasn't for sirocco I would never have um, got in into choirs, you know, and we can talk about how, how all that happened in a minute if you like, but I, I wouldn't even be talking to you. You wouldn't even know who I am if it wasn't for that band, you know, giving me that break and um, still very close to all the members today. You know, we're, we're really like brothers, you know. I, I just love that, that you wouldn't have even got that gig if you weren't just a bloody nice person, Jarms. Well, it's just, I was just happy to carry gear. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say again, I think that's actually a beautiful story that is mm. a very important message for some people to hear. But yeah. don't negate that. That does not negate the fact that he was impressed with your musicianship in the first place. Like, really, yeah. if you played like shit, it wouldn't matter at, in <laughs> the other stuff. So you had, Probably. you had both. Okay. You had both. And I think that is why everybody that knows you loves you because we can see that we see and experience your generous spirit and your um, kindness and helpfulness. So I'm thankful for Sirocco for getting you started. Yeah, well, I certainly am too. I mean, it's, I can't tell you how much that changed my life. You know, I went from playing in smoky pubs for next to nothing to being picked up by the ambassador of our country playing on stages to tens of thousands of people and it was it was just amazing but you know what i really loved about it too is that there wasn't there's no ego with it like um because sirocco was in that sort of more folk world music scene it was it was always just real you know and the people we collaborated with all over the world they were the same you know and all the folk festivals and I think I was just so lucky to be around such great musos as a young musician. And I think too, because the guys were all older than me by 20 years, by the way, you know, here's a 25 year old suddenly hanging out with guys in their mid to late forties. And I think just as far as, I don't know, a, a young person needs that, I think sometimes. And I think it was really good for me just to learn, you know, just the art of professionalism and, and just how you carry yourself too, because I was suddenly around some really different people to who, who I'd been around. No offense to who, who I was around before, they were great. 
but you know, I just think it's really great. And I consider them mentors to me, you know, I mean, they'd probably laugh if they heard me say that, but um, yeah, yeah, it was really good. Okay. Now, oh, I just, I just want to hear everything. I've already learned so much about you, but you better how? Better get your listeners to wake up first. No, no, I'm okay. so sorry. All right. Everyone wake up, wake up. No, <laughs> they don't. This is fascinating, Jams. Okay. Now, how did you get into choral composition, which is certainly how I met you? Um, yes. Oh, I can't. Actually, I can't even remember. I think when I first met you, you were doing a Music Aviva gig, I think. Music Aviva in okay. schools. And it would I, have been Sirocco. It would have been, but I don't think I saw Sirocco. I think okay. I met you. I went with, I, uh, help me, help me. Um, and, oh, I know. And Louise. I was, yes, I think I was doing maybe composer in the classroom or something. Something like that. And then we, mm. I met you over a cuppa or something with some Music Aviva people. Anyway, either way, I know <laughs> of you more through your choral composition. And I have done some work with, and my children were in Birali, um, and you've done composer in residence at a school that I've been at. We created you, the children created a fabulous song for them. So I know you as a choral composer. And can I say as a choral composer slash storyteller, because that's the way I think of a lot of your compositions. I, I think of them as telling a story beautifully. Mm -hmm. So, but that, that's my opinion. I'd be interested in your opinion on that too, but maybe we bookmark that one. So we'll come back to that storytelling. But how did you end up writing choral music? So you're touring the world, ambassadors are picking you up. You're with these amazing people performing. How did you mm. end up writing music for choirs? Okay. So, so Rocco, we did a lot of special events and, um, you know, big public events where we'd be hired to come in and be the party band for fun, but also the serious band, maybe playing with orchestras or anything. Um, and big events like, you know, the Centenary of Federations or the Australia Day fireworks, um, opening ceremonies to things, because we had that sound, you know, and we collaborated with so many artists. Like we, we, um, we collaborated with the guys from Yothi Yindi, we collaborated with, you know, famous Arabic musicians and Celtic musicians and Pacific Island musicians and Chinese musicians and more. And, and so there was always this spot where Sirocco could be, you know, to tell that story. And in 1999, I believe, um, we did the Australia Day fireworks with the uh, wonderful artistic director, Andrew Walsh, who's, who went on to do a couple of Olympic games and various things amazing guy and um he and lynn williams were working together so he was the artistic vision for the whole thing and lynn was the musical director i'd never heard of lynn at that stage i'd never heard of um choirs like sydney children's choir i at that point there was no gondwana voices it was sydney children's choir you know mm -hmm. and um stephen leak was a main force of composing and Look, to be honest with you, I'd, I'd never heard of Stephen Leake. I, I wasn't in the choir scene. So, you know, and there was Sarah Hopkins, of course, and uh, I'd never heard of Sarah. Actually, no, I had, but not as a composer of choral music, as an amazing harmonic singer and cellist. Uh -huh. So that's because she's in that world music scene too. So that's, this is how, how green I was to choirs. Yeah, but and, it's a um, different, it's a different, it's a different segment. I mean, I know we're all in yeah. the music world, but yeah. but each area is by its nature quite a bit separate and we're all so busy in our own little areas, you know. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the names you're talking about as great performers, I'm just nodding and going, yep, great. Yep. Right. <laughs> I don't even get to go watch performances. So I don't know these great performers, but I yeah. know Lynn Williams, I know Sarah Hopkins, I know Stephen Leake because they're in my little world. Exactly. So, I mean, so that's quite understandable so you're slowly yeah. the curtains are being opened on this new little segment of the music world <laughs> that's what happened so yes for the for these fireworks andrew had this idea that a, the, the young endeavor tall ship would sail into sydney harbour 
and sail into Cockle Bay at Darling Harbour and in the sails of this tall ship would be kids singing, a choir. Oh, oh that, and, yeah, easy. Stick the kids yeah. up on the rigging. <laughs> and they did it. They were hanging up in the sails with all this special gear. Anyway, it was a brilliant idea. But, of course, as, as we all know, for all these events, it's pre-record. You know, like even when you see people at the opening ceremonies all playing in the orchestra and that, they're just playing along to themselves because nothing can go wrong, you know. So you go into the studio, you pre-record. Miming's a bit of a, a dirty word because you're still playing. It's just that what you're playing is along with yourself, you know. Like So it just saves any hassle. So we had to go and pre-record this thing so it's going to be projected through the speakers and of course the kids are singing it on this tall ship it was brilliant and the choir was called sydney children's choir run by artistic director lynn williams mm -hmm. now i had never written a choral work i i had written a bit of music but i don't think i'd ever written lyrics which may surprise a lot of the listeners out there because you you all know that i'm quite well known for my lyrics yes but you know 300 pieces later you got to remember i had never written <laughs> Oh, lyrics I, that wow. writing lyrics is something that i've had to i don't know i talked about how I've, how I've done that a bit later but um anyway so i just put my hand up you know i'll do it and they, <laughs> okay you can do it i got home and just thought oh boy what am i going to do i don't i don't know what i'm going to write here but they wanted a song to sort of metaphorically talk about the arrival of the tall ships in australia but also not say that, if you know what I mean, because it was just about all the journeys to Australia. And, um, yeah, I just sat out the back. I lit a little bonfire out the back and cooked a bit of food and had a glass of red wine. And I thought, well, I'll start with something that makes me feel safe, my Irish whistle. So I pulled out a B-flat Irish whistle and I wrote a melody called Let Go the Long White Sails. Well, that's what it's called now. But I wrote that melody. And a mate of mine was over and he kickstarted me with a couple of ideas for lyrics. And then I wrote the song. Um, and that song was called Let Go the Long White Sails, which that I think was your most first, people... That was your first choral... Yeah. Oh, well, cool. I didn't even look at it as a choral work, really, because I just wanted to write a, a piece. And, and back then you couldn't Google, you know, the best range for a choir and all that kind of stuff. So... <laughs> I rang Lynn, who <laughs> must no. have been just rolling your eyes. I mean, we've been great friends ever since, you know. I, I think, yeah, what must, she, what, what must she have been thinking? But I just said, what's the best range, you know? <laughs> and she said, well, don't go below B flat. And I think if you go up to around an E flat, that's great. And as you all would know, steady hold, it starts on a B flat and the top note is an E flat. So I followed Lynn's instruction directly and um, they loved the song and... Um, when we went to the studio and recorded it, I just, I just couldn't believe it. I just thought that is the best thing I've ever heard mm -hmm. is the sound of these kids singing. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I'd heard a lot of music by that stage. You know, I've, I've played with musicians up in the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. I've played in the Himalayas. I've played with Indian musicians. I've played with musicians all over Asia. I'd heard some amazing things. I'd heard some amazing, you know, didgeridoo players in Arnhem Land, bagpipe bands. I love it all, right? <laughs> but when I heard these kids, I couldn't believe it. I just thought that is the best thing I've ever heard in my life. And I still didn't really know what the future of all that meant. You've got to remember back then I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to be a choral composer, you know. So that event happened. Things moved on. I was on tour with Sirocco for two years, maybe, yeah, maybe nearly two years. And um uh, Lynn and I got in touch. I don't quite remember how, but she said, would you like to do a a commission? You know, we love that song. Do you want to write some more for us? And I said, yeah. And I, oh, I actually sort of didn't really know what a commission was, <laughs> but I didn't, I certainly didn't know what to charge. I just said, oh yeah, I'll write you something. And she said, well, what are you going to write about? And I thought, well, look, if I'm going to write them something, I better write about something that I really feel in my heart or else I've just got nothing to say. And it's interesting that 20 years or a bit more later, that's still what I do, you know, and everyone knows me for that, that I'll find a story that matters and I'll tell it, you know, and um, I think it's a really great way to write because it gives you a purpose to start that initial sound, you know. 
and lyrically the reason i've always written well mostly written my own lyrics is because once again i was so innocent to the whole thing i had no idea that how would you go and get a poem or who do you talk to or how do you get a text you know so i just decided straight away no nope, i'm writing my own words and i'll figure out a way to do it you know and um at the time i was really into you know and i still am but i was really into singer songwriters like Joni mitchell and tom waits and neil young towns van zandt um willie nelson merle haggard you know i was just into all that stuff um big time you know leonard cohen um and so look i thought you know i'm just going to spend a lot of time analyzing their lyrics bob dylan you know the same and so I guess I just straight away thought, you know what, I'm just going to craft my own lyrics and my own music in my own way and see what happens. And then I, I talked to Lynn and she said, well, what are you interested in at the moment? And I, I said, um, the sea, you know, the ocean and stories of the sea. And I'd just finished reading some great books on Ernest Shackleton. And um, she was performing uh, The Beautiful Mahogany Ship by Michael Atherton, who, by the way, was... Uh, in Sirocco in the early 80s, <laughs> four oh. years. He was one of the one of the first members of Sirocco too. Amazing, hey? Oh, let's hope he so, wasn't that cranky one. No, he wasn't. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely wasn't. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I, just, I went home and I thought, well, I'm reading about Ernest Shackleton and, and Frank Hurley. I love these stories. I'm definitely going to write a piece. At that point, I was going to write a piece for Frank Hurley, not Ernest Shackleton, because Frank Hurley is Australian. And Frank Hurley, of, of course, took all the amazing photos that we know of endurance. So I thought, Frank Hurley, I'm going to write one about the Portuguese, you know, um, leading up to Vasco da Gama, because that's such an important part of the history of the sea. Um, I thought I'd write one about the Sargasso Sea, and that's, of course, the PC of Berries. And then um, I collaborated with Andrew from Sirocco, and we wrote Ancient City together. So in that space of a couple of weeks, I wrote Shackleton, Sea of Berries, Volta de Malago, and Ancient City. And I think that was that was the song cycle that we called Turn on the Open Sea. Turn on the Open Sea. Yeah, can I yeah. look, I have to stop you here, Jarms. You're telling me that the obviously I'm just learning this. The first <laughs> song the first choral piece you wrote was mm the masterpiece let go the long white sails that everybody still loves and still sings and you're telling yep. me that the second choral work you wrote was this song cycle that as i as with the other one people still sing and love and they were your first pieces like there yeah. is a little part of my brain right now that is really resentful of this amazing talent you've got but mostly I'm suppressing that little bit of jealousy, okay, and just saying, wow, I mean, I am just in awe of your talent. And those people who have not heard those pieces, um, I reckon just even hop on YouTube, Google them, you'll find someone performing them on YouTube, surely. Amazing pieces. And, um, oh, well, that's off to a really good start, Giles. I'm, <laughs> well, well, I've like, always... Honestly... Just I've honestly, got say, I, I've got to say, I, it's really, it's important to say this. I, once again, I just came at them from a place that wasn't to do with trying to write a choral work. I just wanted to write music, music, and then I, I put it into a choral setting, you know. But look, even Sea of Berries, I'd written Sea of Berries, the A, the B, the C section, whatever, and I'd written it, and I gave it to Lynn. She said, "Great," but she said it needs to go further. You need to. You need to do something else with it. You need a, another middle part. And so I did. I went back and I wrote a part that, you know, for those that know the song, it's the lyrics, Water Crystals, that whole section that goes into G minor. And it's got this sort of Debussy chord progression. Look, it, once again, um, you know, if Lynn hadn't had said that to me, I probably wouldn't have done that. So uh, she really helped, you know. And even in Shackleton, when it goes, times were hard, but we made it over, made it over, they wonder why. Now, that's the best little melody in it, um, which I wrote. As Lynn had said, you need to have a change because my original melody actually just repeated 
same. And when times were hard, but we made it over, made it over, they wonder why. And then it did the same again. She said, oh, because it's the same, you need to just have something different. And so, yeah, I'd learned straight away from from her and, and, and other people too. And then, of course, you know, I just started listening to so much choral music and yeah, but one, I think one thing just led to another and I can't even quite remember how it all it happened so fast now, but after those songs, I, Mark O'Leary came mm -hmm. up to me and Mark is a, I love the guy so much. He's a great friend and I just think Mark's such a great person in, in Australian music. And Mark said, these are great. Let's publish them. And I, <laughs> once again, I was so innocent to the whole thing. Okay, hey, sure. <laughs> let's publish them. And it was different back then to what it is now. You know, there were way less australian composers you know of choral mm -hmm. music and i think it's a great thing that there's so many more now you know you look at these wonderful um sites like sing score that um mm -hmm. you know isn't that a great site and yes. there must be what um 20 20 to 30 composers on there you know annie and joe and 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 i think michael atherton's on there and so many great composers on there and um it isn't it great to see but, you know, back back when I wrote those pieces, I think there was, you know, as far as the published composers, there was probably the Mortons, there was Sarah Hopkins, who'd just written Past Life Melodies and all those great pieces. There was um, Stephen Leake, of course, mm -hmm. and um, Sarah Hopkins. Uh, oh, I mentioned Sarah. Um, and, and there'd be a hand, oh, Michael Atherton, and, of course, your Ross Edwardses, and, you know, Peter Sculthorpe. And so there were, there were people writing it, but I think there's so many more now. So back then it was a different world. The The internet wasn't in play with publishing. So, you know, when someone like Mark came to you and said, oh, do you want to publish? You just go, yeah, okay. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, Mark's printing the music and it's being showed at choral events or whatever. Yes, yes he's then. taking you, it to workshops and getting his choirs yeah, to sing it. And Yes. There was no online, you know. No. Mm -hmm. So people got to know you in that way. They didn't even know what you look like, you know. I mean, I'd go and and do conducting things and residencies after that and people they thought i was going to be some old man because shackleton sounds old <laughs> it sort of sounds nostalgic they were waiting for some old guy to turn up and at that stage i was a long-haired hippie you know so <laughs> so um yeah it's it's pretty interesting but um yeah mark you know if it wasn't for mark as well i, I probably wouldn't have been heard you know i mean he got my stuff out there and and then it really quickly moved then. Like I I can't really remember how, but I wrote those pieces. And then I think I wrote The Will to Climb, again for Lynn and Mark. Mm -hmm. And then I just started getting commissions, commissions, commissions. And I'm talking averaging more than 10 a year, you wow. know, and sometimes 15 a year, yeah. And for all sorts of people, you know, for schools, for choirs, for choirs overseas. And yeah, I don't know how it all happened so fast but it, it it did and by sort of 2005 2006 i was definitely writing a lot of um music and and then i started doing my first residencies because again i didn't even know what a res residency really looked like you know yes and my first residency was with caulfield grammar with the wonderful ruth ruth friend and davina mcclaw that run take note music yes awesome people they and are yep Again, if it wasn't for them, I don't even know if I've been talking to you now, but they were, they loved Shaco and they loved those songs and they wanted to put on a musical or a theatre piece with music about the Great Ocean Road and the history of the shipwrecked coast of Victoria. And because I'd written Shaco, they just thought, wow, this is going to be great. So they, they dreamed up this amazing res residency that went for months. I'd go Mom, down to the months. school. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Not full time. I, I, that would cost oh, was, a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it was. It went over a year actually. But in that, over that time, I probably went down five or six times. You know, and wow. they had lighthouse operators, poets, historians, artists, me, all these people coming into the school to educate the kids about the Great Ocean Road. We went on an excursion there. I think this would have been in two thousand and three, or maybe two thousand and four, and yeah, maybe two thousand and four. And um, yeah, we developed this incredible song cycle and that was called Beyond the White Sails. And that's when I wrote a whole lot of new songs similar to Shaco and Let Go the Long White Sails. Um, 
but yeah, that was the first time I did an actual residency. And again, I was so naive when they, when they said, oh, you know, we want you to come down. I'm like, okay, yeah. And the first thing in my sort of working class boy's mind was got to save the money. This is Caulfield Grammar. Yes. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm more than happy to stay in the boarding house. You know, you have to get a hotel. I'm cool. I'll stay in the boarding house. I know. Oh, okay. Well, all right. So Sunday night, I rock up and this boarding house, no offense to Caulfield Grammar, but this was <laughs> the boys' boarding house. <laughs> you know, they're saying there's a smell in there that'll outlast religion. <laughs> My God almighty. I walked in there and I'm like, this is not going to happen. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I rang him up and I said, is it okay if I don't stay in the boarding house? <laughs> They said, yeah, we didn't think you'd last that long in there. So, yeah, that night I, I changed and got a hotel and, and thus began my journey as an artist in residence. <laughs> oh, wow. And yeah. you did it for all sorts of people. You even did a week with us I did. at Sandgate State School when I was there. I That still, I believe that was like the highlight of my time there. I'd been there nine years and I think I was there a year after that as well, but Mm. I I just think your visit there illustrated like the pinnacle of having built a program because... Oh, it was just a great thing working with you there. And well, well, look, it was just, it was so amazing for these kids. Like state school, government school, for those people who maybe are listening overseas, a state school is a government-run school. And we just worked really hard to build um, music knowledge and choirs and things. And we won a grant mm. from was it q150 the queensland yes, it was. yeah queensland 150th anniversary of being a state or um and we won uh we applied for and got a grant so i went yes let's do this and i because i had so much support from the school they said yes you can apply for that grant and yes you can spend it on that so that was tide of the blue fabulous song i wonder oh. if they're, pro they're probably not singing it anymore but oh, no it's going to be reverse hold on i've got something on my wall just a minute okay <laughs> i've got a creaky seat here i hope it's not annoying everyone okay no 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 and it's going to be reverse because i think the camera this was oh, wow. one of the gifts i was given when i left the kids all contributed now it's reverse oh. i realize that says reverse but the yes. tide of the blue and it was Beautiful. by um, with the handprints of kids from a couple of the classes um, where you're a great teacher and we wanted to recognise you to recognise our appreciation. And that hangs up there on my wall, the tide of the blue. And, you know, you just don't know how those, sorry, away from the microphone, you just don't know how those things um, ripple through time. And no, keep I, I, affecting I people, you know. Oh, I agree. I it would take me a week talking to you here about all the stories like that, where someone's come up to me and said, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, we did this, or we wrote that, and that changed my life. Like it happens all the time to me, and it's just such a testament to the power of music, isn't it? But, you know, those residencies are what it's all about. You know, I've done hundreds since then, you know, and written pieces and like that one, those little two girls wrote that line, that chorus, so beautiful. And yes, yes. without their gift, the world wouldn't have that, that bit of music, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, I can't tell you how many times I've been at a school and some little kid who I've probably never see again has come up and just sung something that is the most golden moment that's changed their community forever because it might become their school song so magic amazing it yeah. is so you know magic. i've got to share this little story with you this 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 will blow your mind i had this on my phone just forgive me for looking down i just want to read this to you and i'll tell you this little story of it's just one of the best i've had for a while so it's hard to put into total context, and I hope I don't take too long to, to tell you the story, but um, I've had a lot to do with writing music for the Western Front and, and World War II as well, but I've, I've had a passion, as you would know, Deb, for a lot of the stories of the Western Front. 
And of course, you know, going back um, a few years now, we had the centenary of all these particular battles, you know, from, from mm -hmm. Mel, Passchendaele, you name it. So I think a lot of Australians have been part of that. Um, so I was commissioned by the Hunter Singers to write a piece for the centenary of the Battle of Framel. Now, as most people would know, Framel was the first um, battle that Australians fought in the Western Front and our darkest military uh, moment in history. So in 24 hours, we had more casualties at Framel than the Boer, Korean and Vietnam War combined. That, mm -hmm. That's just in one night. So it was an absolute disaster. And um, so Kim commissioned me to write the piece. I'd always wanted to write about Framel. I did heaps of research, read all the books I could, but I had to go and be there. So Kim very graciously flew me over to France. I went out to Framel. I spent a week there on my own. I just got a little hire car. I drive out each day through the fields to this tiny little village. You know, it's just got a church, a cafe and a school. And I just walked the battlefields. I met with locals. I just sat, read books, read poetry. I sat by the graves of the diggers and just took it all in, you know. And I won't go into all the details because it'll just take too long, but it was a very powerful trip. And um, from Ella, as course, as you know, that's where we have recently, thanks to a man called Lambus Inglesos, a, a teacher from Melbourne, he spent a decade painstakingly proving that there were up to 200 missing men off the, the, the roll of who died at Framel. And thanks to him and all the work after, everyone would know the story that only about 10 years ago, they dug up around 150 bodies in the soil right there. And there's a new cemetery at Framel. Unbelievable. Mm. So I knew about all this, of course. Here I am sitting there down at the at VC corner, which is the famous place where the Battle of Fromel actually happened. And mm -hmm. I've been there for about four hours and one person turned up, just one guy. And he got out of the car and no, actually he wasn't in the car. I had a car. That's why it stunned me. He just turned up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. In the middle of this field, you know, he yeah. just turned up. And I thought I'd better say hello to him. And he spoke French to me. And I tried to answer him in my schoolboy French, failed. And then he had a laugh and goes, oh, I'm just joking, mate. I'm an Aussie too. Oh. <laughs> we talked there and it was just amazing, right? He had, he was a, a very highly decorated Australian soldier who had fought in Afghanistan. And during the campaign, he had suffered serious injuries himself, both physical and mental, and he had lost people under his command and many injuries to people under his command too. He just finished his service and he was trying to recover from um, PTSD. Mm -hmm. And to do this, he decided to walk and retrace the footsteps of his, oh, I think it was his grandfather or great grandfather. Forgive me if I'm wrong. And he walked all around Northern France on his own, on foot. And that's why he walked in that day. Now we talked and talked and talked and then we got to where I lived. And when I mentioned the name of one of my best mates that lives here in Valor, he just couldn't believe it because he, they had served together <laughs> and with his brother, because my mate was in the Australian army as well. Oh. When I came home and told my mate what had happened, he just couldn't believe it. Right now, this is, we're talking now, uh, how long ago? What, what year are we in? 2022? 16 was the Battle of Fromel. So this was 2015 that I was there. So this is seven years ago. I was at Fromel, made that amazing connection with my friend here who'd served with this guy. With complete respect, by the way. Anyway, let's go to an aside. About 15 years ago, I wrote a piece <clears throat> called Band of Brothers, and I wrote it for the Southport School on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. It went on to become and still is their school song. Okay, side by side, forever young, row on row, our finest sons. Though you never came home, your memory lives on. It's, it's an amazingly beautiful piece and the school sings it with pride. I get this text message. This is just like 
two or three weeks ago. Dear Paul, my name, I won't say his name on the podcast if that's okay. I might just want to respect his privacy. Yes, certainly. So my, yes. my name is boom, boom, boom. And I've just had the pleasure of watching my son graduate from year six at the Southport School. As part of the graduation ceremony, the boys sang Band of Brothers and it brought back many memories for me. As an Australian Army veteran who served in combat in Afghanistan, who lost men under my command and who lives with physical and mental injuries, I was touched by the words of your song, solemnly commemorating the service of the old boys of TSS and acknowledging the cost of war while seeing in its darkness the light of life to be well lived. Those words inspire me to honour my comrades through my life's journey. Thank you, Paul, for the gift of Band of Brothers. Your sincerely, Simon. Now, don't now, tell I, me. No, no, don't tell me. This is. <laughs> I wrote not, back to him. It's not the yeah. guy that you. Um, yeah. No. Okay. I know. Sorry. So I Go wrote on. back to him. Just said, mate, I'm happy to share more songs with you. Blah blah blah. I'm so honoured. So nice of you to reach out to me. That kind of stuff. He wrote back. Thanks for your heartfelt reply. I'm honoured by your offer to send more songs and lyrics. And then he says, I think we may have met under a tree as I stopped for a drink at Framel in the battlefield in 2015. Can you believe that? You know, so the, <laughs> these are the things that really matter to me the most, you know, in my career for sure. I mean, that, that is guy, nice. what he what he's been through, you know, and the service to our country and yeah, it's just that's what really inspires me to keep writing music about real things and stories that matter, you know. That is unbelievable. Look, you've got to stop oh, this because you keep nearly, <laughs> nearly bringing me to tears. You've got to stop this. Okay. Well, you could, could you imagine when I told my friend back here at Valor who, who served with this guy? I mean, it was just, I, I said, you would not believe the text message I got and what it led to, you know. So, uh -huh. yeah, it's just, it's pretty amazing, you know. That kind of stuff happens all the time if you're willing to write stories that, you know, do matter, you know, and I've written it for Afghani refugees. I've written for Burmese refugees. I wrote a piece for Malala, as you know, um, Aung San Suu Kyi. You know, I think if you, yeah, if you write about stuff that has that weight, it's going to happen, you know, that you, you'll, you'll connect people, you know, and you'll touch people. And yeah, it's really important, I think, to me anyway. Yeah. Oh, good heavens. Mm. Okay, that is amazing. I was yeah. going to ask you questions about people of influence and gratitude, and but let's face it, that's what we've been talking about the whole time. <laughs> we don't need yeah. the questions. It's just coming out. Good heavens. But before we get into maybe some specific things, um, is there anybody else that you want to mention? Hearing the way you talk, you there are so many people in your oh. life that I'm sure you'd like to mention narrowing yeah. it down is going to be the problem. Hey, there's been, you've already touched on so many. Is there anyone well, else you want to make sure you mention? Well, one thing I really want to say too, just like, you know, I, I didn't start out to, you know, we've already spoken about this. Like I didn't set out to even know that I was going to be in this world and also as a conductor and I conduct now all the time, but I can really say thank you to all the other conductors I've watched, conductors all over Australia and around the world, because I've just have learned so much by watching other people, you know, mm. and um, these are all my collaborators with Gondwana, you know, from everyone, from Carl and Lynn and Paul and Mark and Christy and Kim and Kate Aubrey and people from overseas like Simon Housley and my good friend, um, uh, david and you know like it's you know david lawrence it's amazing um and that there's so many names i didn't just say there you know but we all learn from each other you know mm -hmm. and as an educator too i just think i've been so lucky to to be around so many great people you know i mean my dear friend harley you know like i learned when i first met harley i just thought wow i saw harley in action harley mead i'm talking about yes like, Yes. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to rethink the entire way I work with kids. I mean, this guy was like a superhero, you know, in front of kids. And I thought that's it because Harley genuinely loved it and loved them, you know, and I think that's the secret to, to let the people in, 
that are in front of you know how much you care about them and I definitely think that's the secret to good conducting. Sure, you've got to have your skills. Yes. But I think your ears are such an important tool, you know, as a conductor, but your compassion and your love and to look into the eyes of every single singer that you're making music with as giving selfless humans, which they are, to be able to do that and let them know how much you enjoy listening to them and then just make brilliant music together, you know. And that's the way I approach every single show. I mean, the only thing that gets in your way is these bad things, your glasses. Yes. Because now I, if I want to see the music <laughs> mm -hmm. and everyone who wears glasses knows this, it's impossible to have clarity of the choir. You know, yes. they look like a bit of a blur. That's right. Well, so, you're, younger, you're younger than me, but there will come a time you get sick of that. And then oh, these are my <laughs> computer ones. Then... <laughs> you just wear these all the time and then you've got the graduation and I just leave them on so I can connect with the kids and I can see the music. So that time yes. will come for you soon, Jams. Well, not necessarily What's that? soon. What's that? What, what is that? <laughs> Put my computer glasses back on. But I know what you mean. Yes, the, the yeah. glasses. One of the joys of getting slightly older. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Mm. I know. But, you know, there are great things about getting older, I think too, it's, it's just nice to, to get to a point where you really do feel comfortable with what you do and how you do it. Mm -hmm. And you've got your bag of tricks that have taken you decades to learn. And I really mean that too, for anyone who is watching this, who's <clears throat> younger than, than us, don't be scared to take time. You know, I think for me, I've felt really, I'm really grateful that it's a lived experience because my bag of tricks, I don't, even pull out half of it most of the time is there you know and it's something that i didn't just learn overnight it comes from years and years of being on the road and different experiences with music and i think that's it's a nice feeling you know um yeah and diversity is the key with music i think i'm, I'm so grateful that i play as well you know because i can go from a choral gig to a school to playing in a band to working on a film score to a TV commercial, whatever it is, and I can boom jump in there, then go out on stage in a theatre piece or whatever, and and that's that's something that only only takes time, nothing else, you know. Time and yes, willingness to have a go and learn and yeah. yes, and so speaking of your bag of tricks, this could actually segue nicely into the nuggets of fabulous that I try to bring into. <laughs> every episode because I just like to um, learn from your great experience. If you were to just give a little bit of advice or resources, songs, games, activities, tricks, because you often work with really large groups, sometimes mm. smaller. I mean, it must be great to get that variety. As we've talked about, sometimes you'll be conducting hundreds. Other times you'll be working intensely with a group mm. of kids writing parts and harmony but do you have any favorite little tricks and tips or resources that you'd like to share with everyone yeah look we all have our you know hundreds and hundreds of warm-up games and songs that we've all learned over the years mostly off each other yes we <laughs> I, could show you, I could show you a bunch of them and i'm still learning new ones i learned a beauty from annie kwok just a few weeks ago we presented a conference together in adelaide and she she taught me one that I'd never seen and I couldn't believe I'd never seen it. But thanks. So thanks, Annie. Yeah, thanks, Annie. She's I, fab too. Do yeah. we know some fabulous people, don't we? Oh, Annie. Annie's a legend. Yeah. But um, And I loved working with her. It was great. But yeah, so look, I, I could show you some stuff like that. But I think maybe the best thing I can say for me, like personally with the way I like to see things running, let's say it's with any group, a large group or a small group, just trying to put it in context. It's very hard to explain sometimes. Often when I'm asked to do a PD, you know, I'd rather like, I don't want to tell everyone what to do. Just give me a choir and, and, and watch, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I'd yes. rather just conduct a choir for a day and everyone just watch and, and rather than try to think of now, what would I do? You know, cause often I just, I'm, I mean, I've got a plan, but I respond to the room so much, yes. you know, yes. And I respond to exactly what's out the front of me. And then I go with that, you know, and that if that means ditching the plan I had, well, I just ditched the plan I had, you know, mm -hmm. um, but I like to have a plan. 
How, however, you know, I think my thing is I love the vowel aligning of choirs at any level, even beginner choirs and kids. Mm -hmm. I love just aligning all the vowels and I love the voice blending. And I'm not the only one, by the way, that feels that, but mm -hmm. I'm really big on moving people around to get the best blend and mm -hmm. using people in the choir that are blenders just to put them in strategic spots. And I, I just love working on a choir like that to create a sound and even a choir of a hundred, you can transform the room just by shuffling people in the right place. And once again, it comes down to these guys, your ears. Um, and you know, a lot of the con con conductors I work with feel the same, you know, the, the voice blending and the vowels. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I know, I think I love working with a big group I mean, it's harder with a big group of say, you know, a couple of hundred because other change is going to matter. Or if you're in a big cavernous room, really other change is going to matter. But with a big group, I think my main thing is motivation, you know, and what I see these days is that we've just got to keep people moving and going and singing, you know, like we should get through a full day, not be too tired, keep motivated. So I think that's my main thing, really. I mean, we've all got our musical things, but yeah just getting people active and to sing together and enjoy it together yeah i mean i could give you specifics but it's quite hard to explain really no 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 i <laughs> you love sort of that have to be there in the room <laughs> no and they are they are definitely nuggets of fabulous and that is that and i do agree i see what you're saying that often demonstration watching someone at work is a far greater learning experience for other professionals yeah, yes, and like I, like I said, to, to respond to the room, yeah, I'll give you a little example. Um, a few weeks ago, I conducted the Male Choirs Association of Australia in City Town Hall. I think we had about 100 and maybe 160 singers or so. There's normally about double, but because of COVID, they've really suffered. But mm -hmm. that's a big choir. 160 is a lot of people to, to manage. And we, we sang this beautiful piece called Tell My Father. I don't know if you know it. It's a great piece no. about the um, American Civil War. And, of course, you know, the losses in that war were so great. It's a very moving piece. Um, anyway, there's an option for a solo at the start. And so I'm looking around this choir and instantly I thought, okay, it's got to be our youngest member because some of the guys in this choir are in their 80s, you know. I think there was a guy in the choir who was 92. Okay. So I thought... To sing this solo, it's got to be the youngest member in the choir. How powerful will that be that this young man in his 20s steps out with that innocence, with all these older men behind him and sings this solo, tell my father, you know, it had to be. So we got this guy out and he was great. He's got a beautiful voice, but he got nervous, I think, and nothing like that had ever happened to him to sing in such a big space in front of so many people. Mm. And so I then thought, okay, a, I don't want him to feel bad. B, if he does lose his pitch because he's nervous, he's going to be embarrassed. We can't let anything go wrong. I think we're going to need help. So I chose the next two guys that were a little bit older than him, just a little bit more experienced, one in his late 20s, one in his 30s, I think. And I simply said at the rehearsal, could you guys sing with him now just to cover him, be there for him? But then I knew that by the time we got to the show, wouldn't it be great if the three of them sang yeah. it together and yeah i mean i'm not the only person that does it i think most com conductors do think on their feet like that but that one decision changed the whole show because it was just so powerful and it made this guy feel so good it theatrically looked good and it musically worked and mm -hmm. unless you're willing to look at your choirs and really listen and adapt to the day and the room and the moment you you can miss out on a lot of those moments and I mean, I've had so many of them. You know that beautiful song Ian Jefferson's um, World War I, um, Always Remember. There was Charlie and George, you know that one? Thomas yeah. and Joseph, Patrick McGee. Great song. Yeah. And I conducted that once in Queensland. And um, <laughs> once again, it's just when the stars align, but there's this little boy up the back. And because I'm listening, I could hear through the choir that he had the sound. And so when we got to the cho choice of the solo, there would have been 30 kids with their hands up. How long is it going to take? So I just said, look, mate, would you like to give it a go? This little kid up the back, me? I'm like, <laughs> me? 
yeah, yeah. Do you want to give this? I just think you've got the right voice. And everyone went, oh, God, I can't believe this is going to happen, you know. And the, yeah. the teachers are like, really? So this kid stood up in front of about 300 kids, p- pianos playing. Kylie lost. She's a legend. She's playing the yes. piano part. We get to the solo. There was Charlie and George. Well, man, this kid sang it the best I've ever heard. There wasn't a dry eye in the house at this rehearsal, <laughs> and, including myself. And then I said, mate, we'd love you to do the solo tonight. Are you okay with that? And he, he said, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd love to. Was, do I sound okay? I'm like, do you sound okay? You could have written it. <laughs> By the way, what's your name? He goes, oh, Charlie. <laughs> oh, no. His name had to be Charlie. So, yeah, it's uh, it's just that's how I like to work. Yes. I really love to respond to the room and, yeah. It makes it more meaningful for everybody. Yeah, that's it. Now, I'm going to ask a really hard question. It's like <laughs> asking which is your favourite child, I think. Which yep. is your favourite composition? What is what is what is your favourite out of everything you have written? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I know mine. I'm going to say it's Shackleton. Um, and I, it's, it is just so powerful, the story of the survival well, not just the story, the, like the whole thing, obviously, musically, mm. it's amazing. And my son sang it in Birrali and just that story of survival against all odds for years. Mm. Two years lost in the southern sea. Like, okay, okay, right? I just, it's amazing. Actually, I must do it again. I have not done that song for years. And then to come back and be decimated by war, to mm. find a world at war. Uh, mm. Mm. Anyway, it is just, it's my favourite. I'm going to tell you it's my favourite. Um, although Let Go Long, Long White Sales is magic too. And anyway, no, I'm going to stick to Shackleton. So what is your favourite and why? Boy, oh boy. I'd love to know what everyone else said to this question. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's really hard. Um, I don't know. Look, one thing I've got to say is that it's interesting the way we sort of understand all each other's work. Yes, I'm sure all the other composers are the same. People know me for a certain set of songs, whether it's Towards Infinity or Shackleton or The Will to Climb or Volta or you know, whatever, Band of Brothers, Let Go the Long Way Sales. But they're only the ones that people sort of hear and know, you know, you write so many more that you're just as happy with and probably are just as good, if not better. But what what happens is that once the song gets known, it just becomes the thing, you know, it's like Pink Floyd, everyone just thinks, oh, wish you were here, you know, Mm -hmm. or they, yeah, or the Beatles, they just think of, you know, hey, Jude, or so it's funny, because there's probably hundreds of pieces that of mine that you don't even know and we're good friends, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's, and yeah, also, and I, I think people thing. also know that they love what they know. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's why we love nursery rhymes and why we chant right. things over and over to little kids and we sing, they're the things you love. The kids will ask for the things they know because repetition is powerful. Um, and, and knowing, so. Yeah, it's interesting too. And because of YouTube, people go to YouTube, which is a great thing, YouTube, but how many of your pieces get recorded and put on YouTube? And if they do, they're often terrible quality on an iPhone. Mind you, iPhones are getting better, but you know, I find for me that everyone knows the six or seven pieces of mine that are the ones on YouTube, like, yes. you know, with mm-hmm. Gondwana singing, probably because they're beautifully recorded, a couple of by Bira Lee as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, Icarus, you know, Volta, Sea of Berries, everyone knows them. Um, and they're, by by the way, I love them all, but they're nowhere near my favourites, you know. Oh, like, okay, so... come on. Well, what's your favourite? <laughs> what's your favourite? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, look, if I strike goal with a piece and I feel like it's honest to the story, I'm pretty happy with it. I mean, I love Malala. That's that's one of mine. I can say I don't know if it's my favorite, but I love it because I just think it's honest, you know. Mm. And um, look, I'll tell you what usually happens. I use, my favorite is usually the one I'm working on. 
You know? Yes, yes. Because I, I just want it to be great. Like I'll, okay, I've got one here somewhere. I'll just read you some lyrics of one I'm working on now. It's a bit top secret information. Okay, we won't tell right. anyone. Just the people that are listening to the podcast. Top secret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, if I get something up here, does it cut off my seeing me or do I just, like, what happens? I, it's been a while since I've used Zoom. Um, Is that, can you still see me? Oh, I can still see you, yes. I'm such a Luddite, aren't I? Okay, so, <laughs> so um, yeah, I've been commissioned this year. I've just finished it, actually, um, for the wonderful um, Primary Schools Music Festival in South Australia. You know, the big mm -hmm. festival that happens every year and every single child in South Australia and a state school sings in it. 12,000 kids. I do know it's vaguely. Brilliant. I obviously should know a lot better, shouldn't I? Okay. It's an amazing yes. festival. It's, okay. And they've been, it's been going for over 100 years and they've been commissioning new Australian works for oh, well over 50, 60 years, I think. So they've commissioned me a number of times and pretty much every year they do one of my songs. And they've just been wonderful supporters to me. But they commissioned me to write a song cycle years ago that resulted in me writing Dreaming in the Sky, Southern Sky, you know, all those pieces. And then a couple of years after that, they commissioned me to write Flight. And that's when I wrote Jetman, Take to the Sky. Bonnie and I wrote Lady of the Sky. And I wrote um, Icarus. So they've they're just been fantastic. Anyway, the commission um, this year, and this isn't uh, this can be public knowledge, is actually about what's happening to the world with the dangers of technology, AI, too many devices, screens, you know, where are we at as technology mm -hmm. is expanding? And that was the brief. And wow. wow, did they choose the right person? Because I'm just passionate about this myself. And being a traveling artist for 30 years, I've seen a massive change in the world around me of how people even communicate on a flight, you know, and I'm not a big mobile phone user. So I'm usually the only one not look staring into a screen everywhere I go. Mm. And so for me, this was a really great commission. And you've asked me what my favorite piece is. Well, I've written four for this and I've got to say, I'm, I just love them. They're my favorite that I've written in a long, long time. So I'll just read you the words to the first one. It's called away from the screen. And just to let you know, the process, sometimes it takes a long time to come up with words, like weeks. <laughs> sometimes they happen straight away. So mm -hmm. it, there's so many ways you can write. But this one, I literally went to my studio. I sat down. Luckily, I had my phone on record. And I wrote the entire whole first two verses just as quick as you hear them, like a rap. Wow. With the music. Oh. And, and, and this is... Yeah, and this is the lyrics. Look around, everyone head down like a clone. Look around, I'm the only one not on a phone. Look around, unaware, disengaged, uninspired, so tired, uninvolved, disenchanted, you guessed it, disconnected. Look around at the world today, for they see the world through the screen in their hand, and they see themselves through the lens of the screen, and they see the screen and the world they see, and the screen is their world and the world is their screen. Look around, look around, everyone, not a sign of emotion. Look around, I'm the only one living in the moment. Look around, I am here, I'm alive, I'm inspired, not tired. I'm involved, I'm enchanted, you guessed it, connected. Look around at the world today, for I see the world with open eyes, and I see myself how the world sees me, and the world I see is the world that is free, free of screens, and the world in me, look around, I am free. There's a whole world out there waiting for me, waiting for someone like me. There's a whole world out there away from the screen. Look around. What have we become today? Look around, we are losing the skills of interaction and play. Look around, do we really need to be entertained all day? Look around, look around. Look around everywhere, everyone, every sight, every sound, every moment slipping by while we're lost in the screen. Look around. Wow. Yeah, so that's, and I wrote three other pieces. The The second piece is about um, fake news <laughs> oh. and it's, it's yeah, the, the um, it's called Keep the Truth Alive. And the chorus is actually Don't Go Down the Rabbit Hole, <laughs> which is a, a bit of fun. But, um, you know, it's, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to say this to you, though. During COVID, so it was about two years, and I lost, you know, like everyone, I pretty much lost all my work. 
and the only thing I had left was commissions. And I'm so, so grateful for the people that commissioned me. I thank all of you. Um, and I had quite a few commissions already booked in, but very, very graciously, a couple of organizations just got in contact with me and said, we know it's gonna be a hard couple of years. We've got a budget. Do you wanna do a commission? Doesn't even matter, just write it, you know. Mm-hmm. How good is that? That's that's uh, special, yeah. Yeah, it, I got to say, yeah. So yeah. I did, I I did have time, right, <laughs> to write all these commissions, and everyone said, "Oh, you must have been so in the zone, you know, as an artist, and all that time." And how interesting! I hardly wrote anything during COVID. Mm. Yep, and I realised that I'm definitely not an inward composer. I'm an outward composer, mm-hmm. and without the concert without the story without the people in the world singing it i just had no voice yeah without those connections and that yeah yeah that process i really tried to i mean i did write like over that two years i normally would have written maybe 25 pieces right Mm. i i wrote three or four and they were great though i was so happy with them like they they just flew out of me and they felt really really good um but I couldn't write anything else. And then about oh, sort of April this year, when the world started opening up again, I, I wrote like 15 pieces in six weeks. Wow. It just flew out of me. And these were some of them. I wrote what I consider the best, like 10 or so pieces in a row that I've written in years. No one's heard them yet because they, they haven't been premiered yet. But yeah, it was just an amazing thing. It was like, wow. You know, and I got this oh, such a moving commission. I've I've got a really lovely relationship with a international school company in Asia, mostly China, Dulwich College. It's actually Dulwich College in England is as old as Shakespeare, and Shackleton went there. <laughs> oh like, no! So, yeah, so this is Dulwich College International, and I've been going over to China for about. Oh, nearly 15 years now working with them and and that all thanks to an amazing Australian lady called Mary Giles who now lives in Perth but she got me in the doors of Dulwich College years ago and I've been going back to China every year ever since sometimes two or three four times a year and they've commissioned me a number of times mm. and I've written some really great pieces for them and um, they can the Shanghai uh, school commissioned me this year to write a piece for their big music arts drama dance festival called mad m-a-double-d and the thing is though all the kids thousands of kids from across these campuses they were locked in their apartments they couldn't even come together to perform but they still wanted to commission me to write them a piece and then it would all be taught online and these amazing teachers from all around the world worked on these amazing ways to get the kids together on zoom and things yeah to perform together i mean i just can't believe the stress these teachers are under too imagine being a young teacher in shanghai during that lockdown unbelievable so these people just touch my heart so much so i the the brief was out of space basically and I just wanted to give them this gift of something so positive and beautiful. And so I'm, I'm a huge Carl Sagan fan, you know, the greatest um, author and astronomer. He's since passed, but Carl Sagan, I grew up watching Carl Sagan and I just love the guy. Everything he says about the universe and humanity, you know, it's just, I really connect with it. So I wanted to channel his thoughts and his positivity, but give them something to really send them on this journey and then the news came on with those awful, terrifying images of all those people, hundreds of them wailing out the windows in Shanghai. Do you remember that? Yeah. Because well, they were in the yeah. middle of lockdown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, it had just gotten to them and they're wailing to the night. I mean, I just found it quite disturbing and really moved me, you know, particularly since those kids were there, the kids I'm writing the for. The kids you're writing for. Apartments. Yeah. Yeah. And so I wrote them this crack and beautiful piece called fly across the universe. And the whole thing is like, 
you know, have you ever wandered into the stars and where does life come from and all that stuff? But then through all this dreaming, you can, you know, sort of, I kept thinking of Peter Pan, you know, just taking yeah. off out the window. Yeah. I thought they're going to, they're going to literally jump out of their apartments and fly through the universe into a better time in space, you know? Yeah. And that, again, that piece, when I wrote that, I just thought, wow, this, I'm happy with this one. But, you know, again, you haven't heard it yet because it, <laughs> it's um, it's not out there yet. But, yeah, it's that's what it's all about to me, you know. And when they got that piece, the kids just couldn't believe it. And I just think, you know, I wonder how much hope that brought to them, you know, during mm -hmm. that really tough mm -hmm. time and for their teachers, you know. Yeah, no, I can't wait to hear that. And that's magic. Mm. It's magic. Uh, yeah. And special. I'm using the word special a lot, but I'll, I'll switch to magic. It's magic. Oh. Now, for the people who have not come across your work, where would be the best place to hook up with you and your work? Well, I um, have a website that has been horribly uh, treated during COVID. I've hardly... I haven't even maintained it. it I was going to say, has it been a little neglected, Jams? Has it? Very neglected, yes. Mm -hmm. my, my golf game is improving and my website is all over the shop. So, uh, <laughs> no, look, I actually, these holidays, I've, I've actually finished up for the year now. These holidays, I'm just, I'm composing and I'm actually going to update my website. I'm probably going to put about 20 new pieces on there, which I'm excited to do. And yes. just for yes. anyone who's interested, and you'll probably all be very grateful too, if I can do it, and I'm going to try over the next few months, I'm going to take every single one of my pieces off that website, and I'm going to edit them all. I'm going to rejig them a bit. Really? Yeah. That's a yep. huge job, James. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Now, there's a few reasons why. I've just gotten better over the years at laying the music out on Sibelius, you know, like, Yes, of I'm just, old enough yes, to say that yes. I remember when Sibelius came out. Yep. <laughs> I had Sibelius one, and um, you know, I just I I wasn't great, you know, at the laying out of it. And I look at the pieces I wrote like 10, 15 years ago, and they just need they need an overhaul. Also, I've got massive hands, and um, see, I'm trying to look how big they are. Yeah, yeah they look big and, in uh, the camera. Yeah. <laughs> And I've got a big, like I can reach a 10th or an 11th. Oh, wow. So that is big. A lot of my left hand parts for the piano are quite big and reachy. And I just feel like, you know, I've talked to a few piano players over the years and I just feel like I want to just change my piano parts a little bit and just make them a little bit more user friendly, you know, not make them easier, just a little bit better perceived. And I'm going to lay all the music out. And also another thing happened to me when I was building the site uh, nearly 10 years ago, <laughs> I was going blind. And so I, <laughs> well, I yeah. actually couldn't, <laughs> there were some spelling mistakes and some typos. So I put my glasses on and I've gone, oh my God, right? So it's time to pull a couple of scores. And then I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna do the lot. So it's a, it's a nice thing to do to update and you know, Nothing wrong with it. Nothing set in stone. So look oh, look but, out, folks, and watch this space because I'm going to revamp all my work. I'm going to put up about 20 new pieces. There's over there's over 80 pieces that could go on there at the moment. So, oh, wow. But you still haven't yeah. actually given us the URL. Ah, it's <laughs> www.pauljarman.com. Oh, that's pretty easy. Paul Jarman. P-A-U-L-J-A-R-M-A-N. And um, yeah, pauljarman.com. The other thing I'm going to do is because um, I've got awesome, groovy teenage daughters and they're all over the Instagram thing, I'm actually going to get a little bit more of a presence on <gasps> Instagram. Are you not, really? Oh, my yeah, goodness. No, not in a sort of, <laughs> I can't bear the thought of having this filming me everywhere I go. I'm not going to do that sort of stuff, but I, I probably will just get a little bit, bit of that going. And my, one of my daughters is going to manage that for me um so that'll be good exciting yep and the other thing to, to watch out for is that um see these days everyone wants to hear your music before they yes. buy it. they never yeah. used to they used to just trust it or throw caution to the wind these days they want to hear it or see it um and i do offer previews on my website and i do offer some 
listening audio things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I'm actually going to update them too. And I'm thinking of actually doing what some sites are doing, which is the music folds and plays as you listen to it, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which I know a lot of people are doing now. Um, so that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where you get my music. And um, I, that's the only place you get it. And, you know, there are always options to go with, um bigger publishers i mean i was published by mark for many years and mm -hmm. i mean mark still publishes some of my stuff and i haven't left mark he's a, he's a, like family to me um but you know about 10 years ago i did say to mark i wanted to go out on my own and publish my own stuff and he was totally all for it yes. so um yeah. yeah which is cool but you know i haven't gone down the path of the bigger publishers like jw pepper or um, even some of the more local bigger publishers and not because I don't like them. It's got nothing to do with that at all. Um, and I probably could maybe have a little bit more outreach if I did go with them, you know, but there's something I really love about just running my own little ship like this. And it's, yes. it's not about, yeah, just the sales and that it's about the connectivity, you know, mm -hmm. and I really love that it's done through me. And if they want my music, come see me. You know, and the advantage is that everyone who buys and sings my music, they're now friends. I know who they are. I've got mm -hmm. their email. We stay in touch, you know, and I can't tell you how many groups all over the world from, you know, from Finland to Morocco to Portugal to the Middle East to Asia, all over Europe, Mexico, you know, I've sold music in all these places and um, I get in touch with them, you know, and if I had a, a big publisher, it'd be a lot harder to do that, you know? Well, so it would why... be, it would be almost impossible to do that. And for yeah. you, it's, it's obviously about the human connection for you. And oh, I, the, yeah, the rewards are huge. I mean, I had this choir from Mexico buy quite a big purchase of my music and I contacted them. I just said, you know, I'm so stoked that someone in Mexico is singing my <laughs> stuff. I mean, I just can't believe it. They rang, they emailed back and said, we can't believe that a composer would contact us. So, I mean, they think we're some sort of, um, you know, omnipotent being yeah. <laughs> that you get this darshan if you hang out with the composer. We, you know, we're just real people too. And so I, I, um, I was just thrilled. And I said, well, look, this is, this is great. Could you send me some footage of you singing it? And they said, yeah, could you send some footage like to say hi to our community? And as soon as they sent it back, I realized that this was a, you know, a really beautiful, genuine community, probably not doing it that easy, you know, mm -hmm. financially. So I can now reach out to them and say, look, if you want anything from me, you just ask because I'll help you out. And that's what it's all about, you know, is it making is. these these contacts and and just keeping it alive like that, you know. Yes. And honestly, even I'm proof of that. You even spent a little bit of time tweaking and working on a couple of my little pieces that I wrote and you added Which some. I'd love to get back to, by the way, one some... day. They're fantastic. They are good little pieces because that jams magic, the jams and O'Shea pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. Yeah. But when you added the piano parts and we worked on it together, just, and the, it's just proof really that for you, it's about, um, the human connection and the heart yeah. and the process. Totally is. That's why you do it, you know, and that's what keeps it all going. I mean, that's the whole point of it to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and it's, it gets back to actually, I just saw in my notes here, it's a lovely thing to mention. Um, my teacher, when I was, you know, a kid, I had piano lessons with this lady and um, called Phyllis and I mean, she was such a good teacher, right? Strict, strong, stern, but absolutely 100% brilliant at mm -hmm. teaching piano. I think she's still teaching piano, by the way. And her, her students just get straight A's. Now, as a 10 year old, I will be honest with you, and she won't mind if I say this, I was probably terrified of it, right? Okay. <laughs> and, and I think I think I hated going there, actually. When I look back on it, I don't think I ever really enjoyed going there to have lessons. I loved playing. I knew she was a great teacher. I knew she deeply cared. But it was pretty hard going there as a kid, I have to say. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't mean that in any disrespect. She wasn't nasty. It was mm -hmm. just she was really strict. <laughs> Good honour, by the way. Yes, yes. I mean, she you had... never showed up without doing your practice. Yeah, that's right. right. She <laughs> had high expectations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wouldn't even let you. I remember once my, she said, do not take those hands off the keys, you know. Now, I, one day I, I had hay fever. Oh, man, did I have hay fever. And I was holding in this sneeze because I didn't want to take my hands off the keyboard. <laughs> well, I let out this huge eruption. And, of course, <laughs> oh, stuff no. went everywhere, hanging down onto my fingers. And I still didn't take my fingers off. The... <laughs> she no. said, take your hands off, please. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, she, I had not seen her, right, in probably... 35 years okay mm -hmm. hadn't seen her in 35 years or so probably more and i was conducting a concert in the blue mountains where i grew up and she walked in and mate when she walked in i just burst into tears oh. i couldn't i just choked up i couldn't even speak about her to the crowd i was that moved because that this one woman who probably terrified me as a child she has given me my whole life if it wasn't for her i wouldn't have traveled all around the world i wouldn't have i wouldn't even have my kids because mm -hmm. i met my wife through music at a festival i wouldn't have my beautiful wife who i love so much you know mm -hmm. i wouldn't have the life i have today i probably wouldn't even be living in the house i've got if it wasn't for music and her gift to me you know and it's something it's so powerful i probably couldn't even tell her straight to her face you know but i hope that all the teachers out there understand what you do for the kids you know and and the way you touch their lives and you know what life's journey is one path the matrix of life you mm -hmm. just have no idea how much impact you have on people and you know my way of saying thanks to her is to be as hopeful and positive and generous to every single musician, but also the kids that I work with in all the schools because, and the kids know me for that, you know, because I, if I can just change one life, if I can just help one kid realize, you know, I'm, I'll be happy. And man, if it's thousands, cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, the other night I went to Jacob Collier with my daughters. Jacob Collier is just amazing, right? I love this guy. And of course, Jacob's audience are all these young, cool, mostly musos, right? So we queued up for hours because we wanted to go in the mosh pit. So there's me. I'm the only guy, man, my age in this queue with all these kids queuing up. And it was like, I knew nearly every kid in the queue. They're like, oh, Paul Jarma, Mr. Jarma. Oh, no. <laughs> I'd, been, I'd been to their schools over the last 10 years. And you should have seen the mosh pit. It was like, old me and all these kids that they all knew who I <laughs> was just so cool. It's like you conducted me at high seas. Oh, you conduct, you wrote my school song. Oh, and um, it was just so nice, you know, being, being in the cool. middle of that. That oh, is no, very so cool. I thought that... there's it. I found my, I found my gang in the mosh pit of a Jacob Collier concert. <laughs> <laughs> Go Jams. He's found his people. I <laughs> know <laughs> oh, oh. it was fun. I love it. Look, I yeah. I know there are so so many stories that we haven't talked about, um, and I I try to keep the episodes to around half an hour, so you'll be doing a triple, okay? I really hope it doesn't seem too indulgent just talking like this. <laughs> I just uh, no, no, absolutely the antithesis of Good. indulgent. It has been. <laughs> A complete joy. But I do want to hear, there's one story that I want you to tell us. Um, and then I'm going to give you a chance to send a message, get on your soapbox and send a message to everyone. Mind you, you've already sent so many important messages. But you were somewhere queuing up for food and you tapped someone on the shoulder. Um, oh, do you know the story I'm talking about? Yes, I, apparently I do. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so because we, well, look, okay, I'll I've just. Been prodded. I, yeah, but I should just tell our listeners 
why I'm yeah. asking, because this you might have gathered from the beginning of the episode that we have attempted to do this recording before and because of internet issues we had to abandon and you'd started telling this story so I haven't even heard the end of it and it was such a good story and I'm sorry listeners out there I want to hear the end of the story so I'm prodding charms to go back tell the story again and I'll hear the end this time and you'll all get to hear it as well well, it's with pleasure. I don't mind telling it at all because it's a cool story. But um, okay, I've just got to think of the years. Uh, it might be 2008, maybe. Yep, I'd say it's 2008. And I went on a wonderful tour with the Arts Unit, New South Wales Education and Training, with their choir, Sing Australia. Oh, sorry, Sing New South Wales. Sorry, sing, sing Australia, sing New South Wales. And because um, I used to do a lot of tours with choirs, it was just fantastic. We'd always go and we present Australian music, et cetera, and a lot of my stuff. And so off we went with a complete set of Australian pieces. Um, I'd written Pem Away a few years before. So we took Pem Away, Worry in Your Tunga, um, Will to Climb. We commissioned, they commissioned a few pieces and I worked with this wonderful, um, Aboriginal elder called Les Bursal. He has since passed, but um, we took some pieces that I wrote in collaboration with him. And uh, it was just fantastic. Great choir. Kids from all over New South Wales and beautiful, wonderful teachers. I'm still in touch with them today. People like uh, Jenny Gregory, Heather Causley and Kathy Wellsford. And um, anyway, we're over there and we're at this wonderful choral festival in Vancouver. And the guest conductors were Christian Grasses and Bob Chilcott. And Bob and I, I, I love Bob's work and Bob's been very kind to me. He's actually commissioned me as well. So um, there we are and we're standing in the queue at the big lunch queue because there's choirs from all over the world. I'm talking probably well over a thousand kids, you know, and all their teachers and all the different flags and all the different languages. It was just fantastic. And Vancouver's a great city and they really put on a good show here too. Anyway, we're standing in the queue and the woman in front of me is singing Shackleton. Times were hard, but we made it over. And um, I can't remember how it happened, but I think I might've just tapped her on the shoulder. I didn't sing along with her. I think I just tapped her on the shoulder and I said, oh, that sounds great. I wrote that <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Anyway, she dropped a plate of food. <laughs> she couldn't <laughs> believe it. And um, anyway, beautiful woman. And um, we became friends, of course. And once again, these stories. So her name's Laurel. And Laurel at the time was there with a Canadian choir. She's a Canadian lady called the Rafiki Youth Choir from Thunder Bay, Ontario. And... So we've met, we've become friends. And by the end of the festival, she said, would you be interested in writing a piece for us? And I said, I'd love to write a piece for you. And Thunder Bay is smack bang down sort of the bottom corner of Ontario there. It was the last place that the amazing Terry Fox got to on the run. Remember in the 80s? Yes. Yep. Terry Fox lost a leg to cancer and to raise money and awareness for victims of cancer, he ran a marathon a day with one leg. And he was, he tried to run across Canada. That was the idea. He started on the um, East coast. He ran, I think 330 days around that straight. He just ran every day, a marathon. Incredible through the ice, the snow across the rug, ragged mountains, you name it. And so he is like, he is the, probably the national hero of Canada. Like he, there are schools named after him. There are mountains named after him. You know, mm -hmm. there's the Terry Fox run, which is run every year all around the world. They, they even run it here in Australia. And to say that he's an important figure in, in Canada, you know, I mean, yeah, he's huge there. Yeah. His parents lit the torch for the Olympics, you know, okay. at the yep. winter games. Yeah. So she said, 
would you love would you like to write a piece a commissioned work about terry fox and well i just i couldn't believe it i mean i mean i'm not canadian <laughs> i'd never even been to ontario i just felt like wow am i going to be okay to do this mm -hmm. you know not that you have to be parochial or anything i i didn't mean it in any other way that i just hope i can connect with the story mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Anyway, I said that to her. I said, are you sure? And she goes, well, the way you told the story of Shackleton and the way you told the story of this and that, that's the guy we want. We want someone who can feel a story like that. And I said, okay, I would love to do it. So <laughs> thanks to just tapping this woman on the shoulder, I come home to Australia and write this piece for Terry Fox called Running With A Dream. And they flew me over to Canada. It was the most amazing experience. And I worked over there in schools for about a week all around Ontario. And then the world premiere of a choral work for Terry Fox called Running With A Dream, written by an Aussie, was in, in Thunder Bay. And then we went up and performed it at the Monument, which is the last place that Terry Fox made a step before he, he went back to hospital and passed away. Oh. so what? it was the most but... moving it was one of the best and most moving experiences of my whole career i mean and i'm including in there you know standing on the battlefields of of from Mel with the hunter singers you know that was wow you know but um i can't believe i can't tell you how moving it was just to go over to, to, to canada and and be part of all that with those beautiful people you know it was very humbling <laughs> And that was all thanks to saying good day in the queue. <laughs> that's an amazing story to finish on. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. Oh, well, it's been so great to talk with you, Deb. It's just so good to see you again. Uh, yeah. Thank there's you. Not, there's not an extra message you'd like to send out to anyone from your soapbox, or do you think you've... No, no, finish. You speak so well. I'd love you to send a final message to everyone listening what well, what look, do you, what do you want the world to know well this is a post covid message actually i mean i could i could talk about so many things i'm sure some of your guests have i mean we're living in such a interesting time aren't we i mean it's mm. really but let's not go let's not go too uh big and global on on this but let's just keep it a little bit more localized in a post covid situation I've been back on the road now for about seven or eight months and all I can see is that we we need to rebuild. It's time that we work so strongly and beautifully together in harmony to win things back, particularly for choirs and bands, because it's like two years has been taken out of the wheel and the wheel has to keep turning. And the, the wheel is so successful with organisations like Birali or Gondwana Hunter Singers or the, you know, um, Young Voices of Adelaide and all the organisations around the world of which we all love and share. But the wheel has, it's, we, we need to repair it and we need to rebuild now. And I, I take my hat off to all the people that are just striving ahead and putting it on, even mm -hmm. if the quality isn't as good as it was two or three years ago, even if the numbers are halved, which they are pretty much. Yeah. So good on you guys for keeping the dream alive but we've got to keep it going and there's only one thing that i've just heard everyone say this year and i say it too is just do it just put it on <laughs> because if we don't it's gonna we don't want it to halt it's got to just keep going thank you very much paul jarman i have enjoyed every second of listening to you and i'm sure all of the listeners have as well and oh, we will pleasure. have to do it again all right anytime anytime and if anyone is out there and interested in talking about any of these things more don't be scared to just reach out and email me um that's fine just the more we all stay in touch the better really wonderful thank you so much jams you're a, you're a legend deb it's great to see you <laughs> Bye. As we know, laughter relieves stress. Don't lose sight of the funny side of life. When is your door not actually a door? When it's a jar. A jar. <laughs> no.
it's terrible. Thank you so much for watching our Crescendo Music Education podcast. For more information about all things Crescendo, including membership and music education resources, visit us at crescendo.com.au. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Music